The second session, there will be three speakers on challenges and reform, followed by a plenary discussion. So we're going to try to stick to the time. So um, I'm very pleased to, to, to begin with Professor Kathleen Lynch. Kathleen is Professor of Equality Studies in UCD and has done much research in the whole area of equality research in education. She was an advisor to the European Commission for three years on education policy and she is familiar with the northern, uh, the northern countries. So it will be very interesting for us to hear what Kathleen has to say. And she has just published a new book, New Managerialism in Education, Commercialization, Carelessness and Gender. So um, I'm very pleased to pass you over now to Kathleen Lynch. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and thank you very much, uh, Minister and guests, uh, for inviting me to speak. I have only 15 minutes, so there's a limit to what you can say in 15 minutes, <laughs> but I tend to say a lot. So I will uh, speak um, to my presentation, but also maybe make some observations from what I heard uh, since I was here um, this morning. I wasn't able to be here this morning, but I work a lot with people from, I think I've worked some stage with people from all the four of the countries, the northern countries actually, here in some form or other in research or education. Um, I suppose the point I'm going to talk about is equality in general, but one thing I'd like to open by commenting on is that education has internal contradictions. Education is a human right. It's governed by the International Covenant on Economic and Social Cultural Rights, by the UN Convention, and everyone knows that education ennobles and enlightens you. And that's one side of education. But there is no doubt that education is also used as a means of social selection. In our society and in most countries, it is the primary mechanism for social selection and class stratification. So when people say, we can get over the point system in the Leaving Cert and there will be no stress, I say, don't be so naive. That is utterly simplistic. Because in this country in particular, more than 80% of people are employees. Employees are selected for most occupations on the basis of their education credentials. So the bottom line is, when you have people seeking employment, seeking to get into college, to get into employment, which is what, to be honest, most people want is employment, you are going to have competition and you are going to have tension. So I am, yes, I think, in fact, I would say it is naive to think that you can eliminate that. And I would be very, very worried about for example, non-publicly controlled, uh, as the minister said, in this country, there is great faith in the fairness and justice and openness of our public examinations. They are governed by what I think is an exemplary body, the State Examinations Commission, in terms of its ethics and its practice. And therefore, we have introduced new tests, for example. And I think, I don't know if they've come up for discussion, but we have introduced the Health Professional Aptitude Test which I know, which is used to select people into medicine. And I can tell you that that has reversed the gender order of people entering medicine. And that was done deliberately. It was in theory done to act, and did it to increase the, the social class intake into medicine from working class backgrounds? It most certainly did not. It was introduced to serve vested interests. So I think we need to be very, very careful when we talk about actually introducing new tests and mechanisms for selection because the question is not going to go away. We will have tension when you select people for relatively or less privileged sectors of society. I just want to say that because I think that we have to recognise the dual functions of education. The other point I'd make is we have had no study in this country of the cognitive or socio-emotional or other skills appraised in our public examinations since 1970. Now, the Madaus and McNamara report. When the Points Commission sat in 1999, one of the things that we made submissions, and we proposed that if there were to be changes, we need to study what kind of, not just as a number of speakers said, especially a um, professor uh, from Finland, if you want, uh, and from Iceland, if you want citizens, we need to look as well at what socio-emotional skills and capabilities we develop in children in schools. And how are we going to develop these? Because Bloom's taxonomy of cognitive objectives has been developed and highly advanced, but in fact, his socio-emotional taxonomy has never been advanced. So we know from the work of Gardner, how Gardner and other developmental psychologists, that in most jobs in life, 
being technically good is not all that you need. There is being, being successful in business. You need to have extensive social skills, diplomatic skills. There's a whole range of human capabilities. So I'm saying, before we jump in to introduce more narrowly defined, often market-led cognitive skills detectors uh, to select and stratify our people in society, let us be mindful that there is more to education than just selecting them for the labour market. There is a whole range of human capabilities that we need to enhance and develop in schools, as a number of people have mentioned. And I certainly feel, before you go changing and introducing new tests, that we need to have sound knowledge and information. I would even query in higher education, as somebody who has examined across four different schools and different disciplines. And something many of you know here, I was co-author of a book on the teaching of and research on mathematics education. If you want to introduce uh, you know, go and research what's done in higher education. There's a huge amount of memorization in higher education, especially in the professional fields. And those of us who are in the fields where there's high level of critique and critical analysis, and where they're quite to write extensive essays and critical commentary, are often seen to be too expensive because we actually require students to think. We will not accept rote learning. I have banned in our school in social justice in UCD, we have no terminal examinations, we have all kinds of alternative assessments. So I think there are a lot of questions to ask in that area. I mention that because I think it has enormous equality implications. Yes, uh, examinations have to be fair and just, and you can improve your Leaving Cert score by, as we call them, grinds or private tutoring. But if you introduce a test that is privately run, commercially run, run by businesses, run by grind schools, you will add another layer of injustice to those who are already disadvantaged in the education system. And that brings me to another point. We have no data in this country, unbelievable, that we have no data in 2012 based on social class on the junior cert and the living cert. I cannot believe it. Why do we not have it? We have been asking for it for at least 30 years in my recollection. And how can we monitor and say that we know what's happening? And we don't have to do it by school, we don't have to have leaked tables to do it, we have it by individual, you can anonymise data, this is the age of technology, we can anonymise the data. But I don't see how we can plan when we don't actually know, for example, what is happening to travellers. Nobody talks about it, I haven't heard them mention yet, maybe they were this morning. But we abandoned, we have 40-something primary or teachers in this country for the most disadvantaged group in the country. All that teaching resource has been taken away. Much of the other supports have been taken away from travellers. Six out of ten of children in primary schools who are travellers, who are our most vulnerable ethnic minority, have mothers who have no primary education or who are virtually illiterate. How are those people supposed to educate their children? So I think Ireland... I, the reason the subtitle of our new book is The Careless, I, I've been right, doing a paper we can call The Careless State on Ireland. And I do believe we have a careless state. The vulnerable, the voiceless, the politically unpowerful people are left to fend for themselves. And I do think we have, and I, I talk about the ideology of charity. And I think the unfortunate thing of the ideology of charity as opposed to the ideology of equality and justice, it does, there are positive things about charity for, at times in life. But when we substitute charity for justice, what we get is happenstantial uh, provision in happenstantial places, depending on who actually decides they will offer a charitable service. So that's my introductory remarks. Nothing. Mine. <laughs> now. Your time is up. Now. <laughs> Well, I have worked for many years on this subject, and I just want to say something about economic equality, because everybody talks about Northern Europe being a model and everything, and I think that's wonderful. It is. Now, look at our own country. This is from 2000, and this is not the current government, but I ask, will it be different between 2011 and 12? This is a silk study, for those of you who survey a study of income living conditions in Europe. And this shows a very depressing picture in relation to Ireland, and it is a very significant education relevance, because... The bottom 10% between 2009 and 2010 had a drop in income, as you can see here, of 26%, the far left-hand bar. The up, the everybody else also had a drop in income, disproportionately, mind you, relative to where they stood, and the top 10% had actually an increase of 8% in income. That is hugely significant for education. And especially when we look at international research on attainment in education and issues like social mobility, etc. And I want to bring us back because people in Ireland, uh, these are literary scores, literacy scores. 
the ESRI survey of 2009. They're not flattering. They show a very clear class bias in the levels of literacy for the higher professionals down to the unemployed. Or we can look at the Leaving Cert. I can assure you that if we had the data and it was publicly available, which in my view any data related to examinations of people nationally, like the HPAT, etc., should be publicly available, we would show an even bigger class difference here. Now, what it shows here is those with the highest grades, a proportion with what are called four Cs, four honours as they're called by the SRI, four Cs are higher in higher level papers, are disproportionately from the professional classes and those who are least likely to have high grades in the, from what we know, these are only surveys, they're not even representative because they, they are not complete data sets and they're only provided happenstantially, in this case by a grant from Bernarders. I want to make a point here. People often say we have our northern colleagues are up here at the top. The countries we say that Ireland unfortunately isn't in this but I can tell you it would fit approximately down here, down the middle, well below Germany. And that is the countries with high income inequality, the United States, and the countries with low, relatively speaking, among rich countries, income inequality, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland are up there. And you can see those with least economic equality have the highest rates of social mobility over a 30-year period. Because, of course, if you have uh, more economic equality in society, people are, for a start, they are better resourced at the lower end, and the discrepancies in terms of resources in advantaging, in advantaging your own children are greatly reduced. And I want to, ch child well-being is better in more equal countries. It's not just about education attainment or social mobility. And again here we see the United States down at the bottom in terms of high income inequality, the UK. You can see that Ireland is there in the middle. This was taken in the mid-2000s, so I presume it might be slightly different since then. And I want to make some other point, which I think is very important. I know this is an education conference, but people forget we talked a holistic approach. Well, if we have, we can have growth in Ireland, we can have growth in many countries, but if that growth is not distributed equally, what parents will do is what parents always do. They will advantage their own children. They will significantly advantage their own children. And you can see here the difference between the United States and Norway, very high income, and huge difference in terms of children's health and well-being. The same countries are up here at the top. So that's the point I want to make. Yes, if we have a holistic approach, it must also include a new concept. I have worked in the summer, this summer with Mondragon in Spain, where it has and a number of other regions. In fact, the president of the International Association for Worker-Owner Cooperatives is coming to Ireland on Thursday. We're having a meeting with Enterprise Trade and Employment, the legal area to introduce new concepts around worker employment, worker ownership, new ways of doing work, so we don't create massive income disparities in our society. And the reason I say that is nobody wants their child to be the one who's be been paid below the minimum wage on a casualised labour in Tesco. They don't. And the middle classes and professional classes who govern education are often very sanguine about this, but they know their own child won't be there. That's the difference. And I do think the professionals, and I include all of us present, I presume most, not all, maybe are professional, but I'm certainly one of them. I think if we want to live in a country where people have good health and good education, we can't make it so polarised that the lower end jobs will be something that absolutely anybody will avoid at absolutely all cost, or we will give them to low paid, unregulated migrant workers. So I think that that's very important for health and education and well-being. We can't ignore that reality. And so, sorry, I have several studies here. I, I don't bore you with the details. But basically, all of them show you. I did a review for the European Commission of 120 studies um, for, for the Brussels uh, a year and a half ago. And in it, I found the obvious, that yes, if you want real equality in education, you have to create a more equal society. You have to create it economically. Because if there are massive income differentials, what happens is parents will use that money to advantage their own children, but you also create a huge fear in society. And that has happened in Ireland. People are terrified their child will be the one who will be unemployed, who will have to emigrate, and we know that that is what's happening. We are, we don't, maybe in Finland, you have huge youth unemployment. Ours would be much, much bigger if we had, our children couldn't emigrate because they're fluent in English and are easily mobile between the United States and England and, and Australia, they are gone. And of course, there's a huge cost to our society in that as well. 
So I just want to refer to another book that wasn't referred to, and this is something I think that people in education won't like to hear, but I think it's very significant. There is a lot of talk about um, uh, the, what I call being saved by science. Now, I've read the Four Force report on future skills needs. I have read all the data, and I've also read the McCarthy report for people who are visitors. It was a review of kind of public expenditure. In the McCarthy report, there is one line about the investment in science and technology, and it says that the PhD students, who were, uh, many of whom were funded extensively and over long periods of time by the state, many of them are not employed in Ireland, and many of them are in, who are employed are in the public sector. So I would like to know where is the data? Where is the data that shows us that, because in mid-2005, and even from the most recent report, Ireland has two or three times as many people studying science and technology as most of our European neighbours. So I'm, I want to ask a few questions, and maybe be very unpopular in asking those questions, but I do think it is a question that has to be asked. We do not have a low investment in science and technology education in Ireland, in higher education. We don't. And the figures, if you study them, will prove that. So I'm asking, maybe there are some other issues in our system, maybe creativity, other issues that people mention, but certainly I think we need to examine the statistics before we say, oh, we need multiples of people more in science and technology, unless, of course, we want to educate them for export. So I suppose my final remark is, I believe that we can have a better society and better education, but I do think it needs to be tied as well to a social and economic infrastructure, which is very different to what we have had in Ireland to date. Thank you very much.